Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Rotundi, and I'm an Associate Professor of Biostatistics at York University in Toronto, Canada. First, I'd like to thank Neil and the organizing committee for giving me a few minutes today to share a little bit about my R package CRT size and the evidence-based algorithm. Now, I'm going to shut off my video here so that it's a little bit clearer to see the presentation today. So this package is a little bit different from some of the other tools that you'll be able to see uh, throughout the conference. So I'm going to include a little bit of background information where I'll discuss a little bit about cluster randomized trials. Then I'm going to discuss the evidence-based algorithm and finally wrap up with our R demonstration of the evidence-based algorithm for cluster randomized trials in my package CRT size. Now, first let's introduce a little bit about cluster randomized trials. In contrast to an individually randomized trial, a cluster randomized trial randomly allocates an entire group of clusters or individuals to either the treatment or control group. Now, examples of cluster randomized trials occur in studies that randomize entire families, classrooms, or geographic regions. Now, why would we want to randomize clusters? There are two common reasons for the cluster randomized design. The first is experimental necessity. So one common example is the context of teaching interventions. In a teaching intervention, it's simply not possible for a teacher to teach different students in the same classroom using different teaching methods. So randomizing by classroom is a logical choice. The second common reason for a cluster randomized design is to avoid treatment group contamination. Now, in some cases where the intervention is simple and can be communicated easily between treatment and control group subjects, Randomizing by clinic or geographic area to minimize the social interaction between treatment and control group participants can help reduce the risk of control group members learning about the intervention and biasing the results. Now, unfortunately, the cluster randomized design has several key complications. The first is that responses of individuals in the same cluster, so the same family or geographic area, tend to be positively correlated. And if we do not appropriately account for this correlation, the variance of our treatment effects, such as the relative risk, odds ratio, or mean difference is going to be underestimated, which is going to put us at an increased risk of type one error. Now, the primary parameter in a cluster randomized trial is what's called the intracluster correlation coefficient, or the ICC, which is denoted by rho. Now, the ICC measures the degree of similarity between responses of the same cluster. But one of the challenges of working with cluster randomized trials is that the estimation of rho is often subject to a lot of uncertainty, which is particularly important when we're planning to design a new cluster randomized trial for sample size and for sample size estimation purposes. Now, once we have an estimate of the ICC rho and the cluster size m, we're able to calculate what's termed the variance inflation factor. And the VIF is simply a function of the cluster size and the ICC. And we could see that the VIF is easily calculated as one plus M minus one times rho. Now, one of the unique things about a cluster randomized trial is that we can see that even if we have relatively small values of the ICC rho, we can actually still have very large impacts on the variance if we have a relatively large cluster size. Now I'm ready to highlight a little bit about CRT size, which is my, a sample size estimation pa package for the design of cluster randomized trials. Now this package includes the traditional power-based standard approaches, as well as what we refer to as the evidence-based algorithm, which is the focus uh, for today. Now full details about the evidence-based algorithm and its applications to cluster randomized trials are in Rotundi and Donner 2012, and all references are included at the end of this presentation. So 
the evidence-based algorithm or the evidence-based approach was originally developed by Sutton et al. in 2007. Now, the aim of this process it is to design your plan study, not only based on the study that you're going to be designing, but by powering it based on an updated meta-analysis of the current literature and the proposed study. So in this way, we're able to learn a little bit about how the study is going to influence current, the current literature and potentially current practice. Now, this approach is becoming more common in the literature, given the recent emphasis on open science, uh, reproducibility of study results, and ensuring adequate return on investment resources. So one of the unique ways of, uh, one of the unique advantages of this approach is that we could potentially perform almost a type of futility analysis, where we can see and evaluate whether or not the plan study is going to be sufficiently large of, in magnitude to sway clinical practice. And in this way, we can help determine whether it's truly worthwhile of prefer performing the plan study. Now, I've included a brief overview of the evidence-based algorithm for cluster randomized trials in the context of an odds ratio and a fixed effects model. So first, we're going to select the number of clusters available per group for the planned study. And we're going to denote this with K. Next, we're going to perform a meta-analysis of the current available information. So we're going to perform the standard steps of a meta-analysis, including appropriate literature searching, and including any appropriate adjustments for clustering in any cluster randomized trials. Now, once we have this, we're going to have an estimate of the fixed effect log, log odds ratio and its estimated variance. From this information, we can then sample a new effect size from a normal distribution centered around the theta hat f with variance as calculated in step two. Now for step four, we can obtain appropriate values for P2, the control rate, M, the cluster size, and rho in the planned study. Now these parameters are often going to be based on a literature search, uh, similar uh, cluster randomized design trials that have taken place, uh, or potentially a small pilot study as well can be used here. Now in step five, we're going to generate individual level data according to this new effect size and the anticipated parameters. Step six, we're going to calculate the log odds ratio and its estimated variance, including any appropriate adjustments for clustering for this new hypothetical study. In step seven, we're going to take this new study and combine it with the existing meta-analysis and re-meta-analyze the results. Now, if we repeat steps two through seven a large number of times, say a thousand, we can then obtain appropriate estimates of the power of the updated meta-analysis to determine whether or not the study is likely to uh, produce a statistically significant result. Now, if we repeat this entire process with a revised value of K, so other uh, potential numbers of clusters that can be randomized, we can then impact the evaluate the impact of various sample sizes on the updated meta-analysis, including the previously completed and the planned trial. Okay, so now let's have a look at a hypothetical example in R. So let's suppose that we have two studies examining the effect of vitamin A supplementation on neonatal morbidity. And our neonatal morbidity outcomes here are something like ear infections or the prevalence of high fevers. Now in global health research, cluster randomized designs are actually quite common because it's simply not practical to randomize health interventions at the individual level. So let's copy this code here. Oh. Sorry, I have to get out of here and get my cursor. So let's go into here. So I'm going to put in my previous studies from the hypothetical 
for the initial meta-analysis phase. So the way this function uh, is going to work is that we have our relative risk here, followed by the lower and upper bounds of 95% confidence intervals. So looking at the first study, we have an overall uh, relative risk of approximately 0 0.65, which corresponds to an approximately 35% reduction of risk of morbidity due to the vitamin A supplementation intervention. Now, we know that this is not statistically significant uh, in the first study. And similarly, in the second study, we have an approximately 66% reduction in risk. But once again, this study has very large confidence intervals and does not show a statistically significant effect of the vitamin A supplementation intervention. Now, I'm going to start the results here first before I, uh, and then I'll walk us through it because it does take a couple of minutes. So the function is N4 props meta. The data is the matrix of previous studies that we provide, which again corresponds to the uh, relative risk and the lower and upper 95% confidence intervals. Model equals fixed corresponds to the fixed effects meta-analysis. The measure here is the relative risk. And here we're able to provide a vector of different numbers of clusters that we're able to randomize. So for reference, we're going to consider 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, going all the way up to 60 clusters per intervention group. Now, the ICC that value that I'm specifying is 0 0.01 with a cluster size of m equal to 100. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the interesting and challenges of, of working with cluster randomized designs is that there are a lot of sources of variability. So this function tries its best to help account for some of these. So we have a parameter SDM, which corresponds to the standard deviation of the cluster sizes, which in practice will allow varying cluster sizes. PC is the control rate. So in this case would be the rate of morbidity in the control group. And we can once again uh, include an estimate of variability for that parameter as well. Iter equals 200. Now that I've just used for computational purposes. Typically, we would want at least 1,000 uh, to obtain appropriately smooth power curves. Alpha equals 0 0.05, corresponding to our 5% two-sided uh, significance level. And ICC distribution equals fixed. So this function, uh, in this demonstration, we're using a fixed value of the ICC of 0 0.01. But the N4 props meta function actually allows a lot of different options. Uh, we have the fixed one. We have a uniform approach where we can specify a lower and upper bound of a of a uniform interval, uh, and then we can sample from our ICC values from that distribution. And we also have a truncated normal approach as well. Now, let's have a look at our results here. So there's an, as an initial step, the function returns a very basic uh, estimate of the meta-analysis relative risk here. So we can see an approximately 40% reduction of the risk of morbidity corresponding to a relative risk of 0 0.6. Uh, the 95% confidence limits are from 0 0.3 to approximately 1.2. So once again, this result is not statistically significant. Now, we note that for each of our numbers of clusters randomized per group, we can actually start to begin to see approximately what these power curves are going to look like. Now, one specific item to note is that there is a lot of variability here because this is only based on 200 iterations. Now, as the number of iterations gets larger, uh, these will produce much more smoother curves. So as a just from this example here, we see that from 10 to 15, it actually produced the exact same uh, estimate of the approximate power. So uh, that's simply due to sampling variation. But based on these results, we could see that randomizing approximately 25 uh, clusters per intervention group would likely provide roughly 80% power here. Now, once again, we see some of the uh, 
distributional, ICC, and uh, cluster size assumptions are included for your reference. But where this gets particularly useful is we can perform quick, quick, simple plots to visually see what our empirical power is going to look like. So here we could see again that roughly uh, from this example, with roughly 25 clusters per intervention group, we would have approximately 80% power. Now, I did uh, previously run a quick estimate with approximately 1,000 iterations. And we could see that once we have our 1,000 iterations, these do present much more smoothly, uh, much more smoothly in practice. And it is likely in on the order of, uh, of about 22 or 23 clusters per intervention group uh, to produce the 80% power. So let me just go back to full screen here and put my video back on for the last uh, couple of slides. So in summary, the evidence-based approach to sample size estimation examines the role of the new study in the literature. So in this way, we're able to power not just the study on its own, but to provide power for an updated meta-analysis to detect a statistically significant and clinically meaningful treatment effect. Now, this approach complements traditional sample size approaches, but it does not replace them. I still strongly encourage researchers to proceed with a standard sensitivity analysis so that they can impact, examine the impact of different ICC values, treatment effects, control rates, and so on, all on, the, on their planned sample size requirements. Now, finally, CRT size is available from CRAN. So if you're interested uh, in using the package, it's freely available to download. Now, the key reference for this work is Rotundi and Donner 2012. And in this uh, manuscript, there are additional details on uh, the use of different uh, distributional assumptions for the ICC. Um, so in there, we discuss the truncated normal version, the uniform approach, and so on. Um, and it also includes a couple of other worked examples. Now, finally, I want to say thank you for watching today and your interest in my R package. Uh, a thank you to Neil and the organizing committee as well for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about the evidence-based algorithm for sample size estimation. And finally, if you have any questions or uh, comments, feel free to reach out. My email address is mrotundi at yorku.ca. And I'm always happy to hear about researchers who are using my R packages and learning more about your studies. So thank you again and best wishes and enjoy the rest of the conference.